Hey there, welcome back to Little Guys, the show about little computers that are trying their best. Unfortunately, the one I have today, well, it is the littlest that I think I've ever seen, but from what I've heard, uh, it never really tried its best, even at its best. And this one's not at its best. So this is a Dell Weiss 3040, and it's a thin client, uh, probably one that an awful lot of people watch this have actually seen before, probably won't be surprised to see on this show. Now, a thin client, if you're not familiar, is uh, basically a computer with very limited processing power whose only purpose is to get you onto a network, usually, so you can connect to another computer somewhere else and do your actual work. Uh, so this would support like a remote desktop protocol or Citrix or a number of other flavors of remote access protocols. Uh, in some cases, you can even use these to connect directly into virtual machines. So, you know, you're sitting at a computer that's not really a computer, but it is a computer, and you're doing your work on a computer very far away that's also not really a computer, but it is a computer running on another computer. It makes a lot of sense. It, it scales well. A business, a business, business. Anyway, these things have their pros and cons to be sure. But for me, what's important is that this one, unlike several of the thin clients I've seen before, but certainly not all, is actually a normal PC. It has an Atom in it. I don't know how good an Atom, I'm pretty sure this thing has some years on it. Uh, but you can see from the back that there's not much to this thing. We've got two USBs, two display ports, and then network and power, and that's all she wrote. Uh, of course, on the front, we have two more USBs and a headphone jack, but other than that, the only thing this is sporting is uh, a power switch. So about that, let's plug this thing into power. Uh, it takes uh, five volts at three amps. I have a five volt, two and a half amp power supply. That'll work just fine. Let's see this thing go. Go, go, go. It won't go. It doesn't go. So yeah, uh, this thing just won't go, except that it will. It just won't go right now. Watch this. These things are, of course, super, super cheap. They're probably the cheapest thin clients I've ever seen in my life. So the chassis does not screw together. There's the computer. Uh, this is uh, your CMOS battery just flopping around in there. And this thing is dead as hell. It, it might even be responsible for some of the weird problems I've had with this thing, but I don't know where to readily get a replacement. Um, I'll worry about that later once I've done something with it. Uh, I'm pretty sure these are RAM chips. I mean, what else would they be? We have a, I think that's an M2 slot of the, uh, the smaller variety. And that's just about the only thing going on here. So there was originally two screws holding this board in, the only screws in the whole thing. Uh, I lost one of them, but we'll take out the other. And this thing pretty much just comes right out with a, a little bit of persuasion. There's like some RF shielding that uh, likes to catch on the board. There we go. And there it is. That's the Dell Weiss 3040. And that is the smallest Intel Atom machine I have ever personally seen. I mean, uh, the Intel Nooks, I, I think, are smaller or the same size, but they're a lot more complicated inside. This has virtually nothing going on. Um, you know, I haven't actually taken this heat sink off to see what's underneath that. But before we do that, I just want to show you something. It's on. There is something about this case that's keeping this thing from powering up. If I put it on, it'll stop working. If I take it off, it starts working every time. And obviously the most likely case is that there's something shorting out on here, but I don't know what it could be. It's, it's not damaged or bent or anything. And I've looked pretty carefully at this and I can't see anything that's touching anywhere it shouldn't. We've got this piece of uh, metal shielding up here, uh, which hovers a good, you know, three quarters of an inch uh, above the board here. We've got the Kensington lock that hangs down into the slot here. It's got plenty of clearance. Uh, this thing isn't touching anything of importance. And then the rest of these touch the tops of these ports. And of course, there's there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, to wit, if we uh, bridge across these, yeah, nothing, nothing happens. It doesn't shut off. It's not shorting among any of these things that's the problem. And you know, I am kind of curious about that bit of metal there, uh, but this would be an awful lot easier if the metal and the plastic weren't one piece. And the thing is, I don't care about RF interference, so I think I'm just gonna take this thing out. Now, of course, it's been staked into place uh, with these little plastic blobs, so I'm gonna have to cut all those off, but it's worth it for the science. Realistically, I could probably just get a flathead under one side of this thing and lever and just break all these things off. 
Of course, this is just a minor bit of the video. I am going to show you this thing functioning. It's not too terribly exciting, except in its banality. Uh, but I just really wanted to answer this question first. I am incredibly curious what here is is touching something on there, because I just can't see how it could be happening. Uh, something's still holding it in. That's still something in there. Oh, you know what? Let's just get the big boy in. There we go. All right, so just for the sake of argument, let's uh, put this case back on here and just make sure it's not somehow <laughs> just pressing on something weird. Uh, wait a minute. You're kidding, right? The, the, the plastic part is the problem? Uh, um, how? This makes no sense. Let me, um... Let me try this again. Is the light on and I just can't see it? Okay, so I feel unbelievably embarrassed to report this, but there's nothing wrong with it. There was never anything wrong with it. It's just that this piece of transparent plastic here is not transparent enough. I, I don't know what else to tell you. Uh, let me turn the lights off here and I'll demonstrate. Okay, I'm gonna turn off the last light here. Okay, this is so dim I have to open the aperture on the camera to see it. Do you see that right there? That's the power light. <laughs> and if I take it back out of the chassis, it looks like that. Like that should be bright enough to shine through that plastic, but it just isn't. <laughs> okay, I feel pretty silly here, but I gotta be clear, I had plugged in a monitor and I didn't get a picture out of it. I tried this over and over and it never worked. But let me put it back together and we'll try again. You know what? I'm gonna lose the front panel here that has the button on it. Uh, and that way we'll be able to, to actually see the status light on the damn thing. I'm not sure if screwing this in is gonna do any good with the metal no longer attached to the plastic, but you know, what's done is done, isn't it? Let's try this again. So this is the Dell Weiss 3040 Thin Client. It has an Atom processor, and in pretty much every other way, it is just a completely ordinary PC. To show you this, I'll need to plug it in, and of course it only has DisplayPort because Dell figured they were going to sell this to you along with one of their monitors, so why would you need VGA or HDMI? Honestly, I guess that's kind of sensible. Now, the trouble with DisplayPort is that you can't always adapt it passively to HDMI, and indeed that seems to be the case here, so I'm going to have to hook up the only DisplayPort capable monitor that I have floating around, which also happens to be an entire computer, which we'll feature in a later episode, but we don't need to worry about that right now. All right, let's plug this bad boy in, and what does it do? We get a power light. Are we gonna get a picture? Ah, there we go. I've seen this before. It'll shut off, then come back on for a moment, and then it blinks yellow three times, pauses, and then one time. According to Dell's website, this blink code means that the CMOS has been reset. Well, okay, I mean, that's not surprising here. My battery is very, very dead. Every single time I lose power to this thing, it, it does this. So this is what's been going on. The reason I thought it was dead is because I couldn't see the blinking yellow light through that extremely milky plastic. By the way, just to give you an idea, this thing is supposed to be a light pipe. They clearly did want the LED to shine through, but even the uh, full power flashlight on my phone can barely illuminate it. I don't know what happened there. So as it turns out, if we shut this off and without disconnecting the power cable, we just turn it right back on, it powers right up. So yeah, I feel pretty silly about that, but not as silly as Dell must feel because their explanation for why this would happen to the average user is that there's actually a design defect in the Weiss 3040 chassis where the CMOS button can be pressed if you compress the chassis in the right place. I know that's not what's going on with mine. My battery is just dead, but uh, it's extremely funny that they screwed this up. Now, uh, as for why the battery is dead, I'm curious when this was made. Oh, you know what? It actually says manufacturing year, 2018. So there you go. This has got, what, six years on it? I was gonna ask the internet, but I don't need to. We'll need the worst keyboard I own. And by the way, if you get one of these yourself, I'll let you know, I've had trouble getting the keyboard to work plugged into the ports on the front, particularly during power on. Uh, the ports on the back seem to be more, I don't know, important 
they have the king's favor. And let's plug in the best mouse I own. So with all that out of the way, this is what comes on a Weiss 3040. This is called Thinos, and I don't really know what it is. If we go over to, to this event log thing, this really does not look like a Linux. Uh, this looks like something bespoke, which I really wouldn't expect, right? Like, I mean, it's, it's odd enough to find any kind of custom-made operating system nowadays. Everything is Linux, with very minor exceptions for stuff like uh, occasionally we'll find like a VXWorks somewhere, but that's usually on really, really thin embedded platforms. Uh, stuff that still has, you know, like a MIPS processor or something like that running at a handful of megahertz. This is an Atom X5 Z8350 at 1.4 gigahertz. Let's just find out what the specs on that are. So this is a uh, products formerly Cherry Trail, and it came out in 2016. Wow, this CPU maxes out at two gigs of memory. Oh, that's rough. Uh, and by the way, that is how much RAM this thing has. So I guess that's all they could actually put in it. It runs off DDR3. It does technically have a PCI Express lane in there, which we knew because the thing had an M2 slot. It does support USB 3.0. There was one USB 3 port on there. And here we go. This has four physical cores. Uh, I don't know if it does like the, the hyper-threading thing. I don't know if they do that anymore. I don't know what happened when. But uh, anyway, this is a quad-core x86-64 CPU. And for this to not be running Linux would be absolutely wild. Now, I did find some suggestion that this could actually be a Linux. Because when I looked up best Linux for Weiss 3040... I found a blog post by one Roy Tank in which he goes through exactly what I'm about to go through here. But when he went to install Zubuntu, it informed him that the existing thin OS was actually a variant of Ubuntu 16.04. So yeah, maybe this is just a Linux that they've papered over really thoroughly. I don't know. Now, I also uh, don't really know anything else about it. I have not explored this OS because I have nothing to really um, thin client Two, I don't have a Citrix server, I don't have um, VMware set up, nothing like that. And I don't even know where that stuff gets set up. Uh, if we go into the menu here, we can't, there's there's no you know applications section. Uh, under system setup, there is a remote connections. So let's see what options we have here. We have Citrix Zen, uh, VMware Horizon, Microsoft, just Microsoft? Like not, <laughs> presumably that's remote desktop protocol, but <laughs> Microsoft. Uh, Dell V workspace and then other. What's other going to be? Oh, this is for something called a broker, actually. I assumed this was asking for a protocol. Uh, I don't know what a broker is. I guess there's options for what it can do once it connects, but I don't see anything here for like, oh, wow, what are these auth types? Improvata, Secure Matrix, Caradigm. Oh, Caradigm and Healthcast. Hmm. I wonder if these things get used in hospitals a lot. This is completely useless to me. There's there's no possibility that I would ever be able to use this for anything. This is such a piece of enterprise wear, which, you know, is often the case with the software that comes on these little guys, I think. Uh, frequently, they're, they're really intended for one purpose in the world, and I wouldn't be surprised if you found a lot of these things have software you can't do anything with yourself like this. But that doesn't mean that we can't put something else on here. I mean, it could have meant that these could have been locked down in some way, but they're not. They're just not. So having no use at all for Thinos, let's shut this down and go behind the curtain. So if we hit F12 on startup, that puts us into the boot selector menu, which looks just like any other Dell you've ever seen. And if we jump into the BIOS setup, this looks just like every Dell BIOS that you've seen since like uh, 2004, something like that. Now, an interesting fact about these is they all come with a BIOS password set, but it's the same one on every one. It's called, oh gosh, oh shoot, what is it? Fireport. That's the default password on these things. And there we go. I'm in. So yeah, indeed, it's got two gigs of RAM. There's our processor. Uh, it's got Intel HD graphics and uh, you know Realtek HD audio, and that's it. No Wi-Fi, no Bluetooth. Uh, that's probably what you could put in that slot in there. And that's pretty much all we can get from here. Otherwise, it's just a, a completely ordinary Dell BIOS. Uh, but the point is, you can now uh, come in here and boot off of another medium. So let me get another medium. This one, you can plug into the front. So I'm loading up Linux Mint on here. And that's because I tried Ubuntu 22, and it worked, 
except for some reason, the red channel was missing out of the graphics. Like, like that, that's it. Like it was there, the desktop was running, software worked, but there was no red channel, just blue and green. And periodically the screen would suddenly resync and I would have the red channel again. And then three or four seconds later, it would disappear. And there you go, it's Linux Mint. So the reason I bothered loading this up uh, other than to demonstrate that this is just a computer and you can do whatever you want with it is I want to mount uh, the existing OS off the hard drive and see what it is. Hmm, where is that drive? Oh, you know what? I think I read that this was actually an eMMC drive. And I think those show up, yeah, there we go, as uh, MMC BLK, if I remember correctly. And there it is. Uh, this is an 8 gig eMMC drive. So, uh, that is not a great storage medium. And I don't think it's possible for it to get any better. I think it's just universally crap from what I've been told. So, uh, I was thinking about putting Windows on here, but that might not be pointful. It's probably going to run just absolutely horribly. But for what it's worth, uh, there's some Linux file systems. So let's mount them. Hmm, doesn't like that. Oh, that's a swap partition. What's wrong with me? In fact, hang on. It's two swap partitions and then a normal Linux file system and then the EFI at the end. Sure, yeah, why not? Oh, it doesn't like that either. Okay, so in short, I have no idea what file system this actually is. Uh, I'm not skilled enough to dig into it and figure it out. It's interesting that they chose the Linux options if it's not actually Linux, so I'm just going to go ahead and assume that it is. However, while trying to get an answer to this, I stumbled across something quite surprising. It turns out that there's a whole genre of people upgrading the storage in these things. Uh, I read this blog post here by Sagacious Suricata, where they actually uh, take the thing apart, um, pull off the BGA eMMC chips. I think that was it right there. And they actually stick a new chip on to give it 128 gigs of eMMC, which, oh man, that <laughs> it almost doesn't even seem worth it. And I'm certainly not gonna do it, but the question that's left in my head is, could I put Windows on here in a pinch? Well, let's find out. Uh, no. <laughs> yeah, here's somebody with a blog who tried setting up a minimal Windows 10 install, and they still ended up with nine and a half gigs, so that would be impossible on here. And then according to people on Reddit, Windows 7 also ends up being about ten and a half gigs, and that's before you install any service packs or anything. So, yeah, it is absolutely impossible to uh, run Windows on this of, of really any flavor. So I guess we might as well install Linux on it. I mean, it's completely useless to me as a thin client, so why not? You know, I have no idea which version of Linux Mint this is, but it'll be fine. Wow, this thing is incredibly slow. It's running off a USB 3.0 uh, stick plugged into a USB 3.0 port, so I'm kind of shocked at how long it's taking just to... Oh. Huh. Installer crashed. And it crashed for a weird reason. It was a string parsing error. You know, I wonder if this thing was trying to read the existing file system uh, and just exploded because it's not really a Linux FS. Let's wipe the drive and try again. Oh, look at that. Does the model of the eMMC drive actually contain like a high Unicode character? Look at that. There's a question mark there. Is, is this a thing? <laughs> So apparently that's an SK Hynix or, or SK Hynix or however it's pronounced. Oh, and uh, look at that. That's uh, somebody else running into the same issue. <laughs> oh my God. Hi, sorry to comment on this after so long. I picked up a Weiss 3040 off of eBay that I wanted to use as a pie hole and a NAS and it fails. Yeah, that's, that's, wow. That would do it. Okay, there's actually like a hand patch we can apply here. User lib64 python36, we just edit uh, this file here. Uh, sure, sure, why not, I'll do it. Oh, there we go. Well, we're getting further. <laughs> and then it blows up here. All right, I manually made a file system. Let's see if we can just proceed here. It looks like it was just the partition manager that died, so if I just proceed, we should be okay. 
Uh, yeah, I don't think this is actually doing anything. I think it's just hung. So I'll probably have to switch to a different Linux or, or something to get this working. But uh, for the moment, while we're waiting for this to fail, I'm curious if I can take this switch out and remove the overly opaque plastic. I would expect this to be like a double shot injection molded button where the, uh, the clear part and the opaque part are essentially stuck to one another inextricably, but it's worth checking. That looks pretty damn in there. Oof. Yeah, that's, um, that's not going anywhere. I guess I could just drill a hole down the center. Well, I, uh, I took too big a bite and destroyed it. So I guess I'm just going to have to keep pressing the button with my bare fingers. So none of this went very well. Well, I guess that's the end of the story for this little guy. Obviously, I'm going to keep trying to, to find a version of Linux that'll work on here, uh, or at least I'll figure out how to hack the, the installer so it works. The fact that you can't remove the eMMC chip and replace it with one that's larger or that doesn't have a weird messed up name <laughs> kind of uh, diminishes the usefulness of this thing, I have to admit. I was going to say from the outset that uh, the fact that this thing is just a computer means that it's one of my favorite little guys so far. Like, it, it really is very, very small. And there are a lot of applications for which I think something this simple would be just fine, but being constrained to only eight gigs is pretty harsh. And I mean, yeah, you could probably uh, plug a USB drive in here, just install to that and boot off of that indefinitely. But uh, at that point, like... I kind of feel like you might as well have a Raspberry Pi or something, right? It's so janky. And I guess now that I think about it, one of the options available might be to get something that goes in the M2 slot here that's another storage device. I mean, it won't take an NVMe drive, but I'm sure there's some sort of cheap adapter out there that'll let you put like an SD card or something like that in here. I don't have anything like that, though. So, yeah, to me, this thing is, is kind of not terribly useful. No Windows. Uh, you can run Linux, but you're going to be really cramped for space, and it's going to be super slow. I think for, you know, what that other person was suggesting, like a, a pie hole, that sort of thing, it might be viable, but I don't know. Uh, I just, I don't like this one very much. But that's about it for this episode of Little Guys. And uh, it was kind of a bummer. This little guy really let me down. I, I thought it was going to be uh, much more of a trooper than it was. Or maybe I let him down. There's really no way to know. At any rate, I hope I didn't let you down. And if you enjoyed this video, then consider subscribing to my channel. Uh, that way I know you're into this sort of thing and I'll make more of it. But if you really want to help me out, then consider supporting me on Patreon like these people here are doing. Because they make it possible for me to go out and get more little guys, which I'll probably proceed to destroy and mutilate through fundamentally not understanding how they're put together. Because I'm not very bright. So if you want to see me continue being a clown, then uh, maybe support me on there. Uh, it also pays for my gas and groceries and rent and all that sort of stuff. So yeah, I'm incredibly grateful to everybody who's supporting me on Patreon. I couldn't do this without them. Thank you all so much. And to everyone else, thanks for watching.